Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today on a virtual conference, Myanmar Tourism, Impact of the Military Coup and the Importance of Peace. As we speak, people are demonstrating on the streets of Myanmar. Hundreds of people are killed, including over 50 innocent children. One of the children that was killed by the shot to, to the head on the street of Mandalay was a teenage girl. Her name was Kial Sin. She was wearing a t-shirt with the writing on it, everything will be okay when she died. Let us pray and hope that everything will be okay as she wished for the great people of Myanmar. Let us pray that the peace and happiness come back to this wonderful country once again. Just to remind you that you can watch live this webinar on our website, tourismwebinar.com. And there will be a recording available, including the profile of the speakers and the PowerPoints. I give the word to the moderator, Steve Knox. Steve. Thank you. You have to, can you see my slide? Raja, can you see? No, I don't. Okay, you have to give me, you have to share screen for me. You have to stop screen, share and share to me. Okay, can you do it now? How's that? Okay. Now is it? You got it? You got it? Yeah. It says start screening. Yes. Okay, you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, I will start. Uh, thank you, Razor. My name is Stephen. I'm in Australia tonight. Um, and I will commence our webinar. The, the, the origins of this webinar started from a Facebook page started just last week called to boycott Myanmar military in tourism. And that site is about recording tourism and travel enterprises in Myanmar that are involved with the military, which has now taken control of the country. This boycott Myanmar Burma military and tourism Facebook grew out of another Facebook page, which has been going for about five, six years. And um, about inclusive tourism in Myanmar. Uh, now that's been reshaped to focus on messages from around the world to help informing and to give support to the people of Myanmar involved in tourism during this very difficult time the country is going through. This concept of where does tourism fit in terms of, of contributing to peace, um, either before conflict has started, when the conflict is on and the emergence out of conflict has been used in many destinations around the world. And some of our esteemed speakers tonight will touch on their observations from other destinations uh, in relation to this subject. But uh, there's a very strong understanding around the world that when tourism is done well and good and sustainably for destinations, there are many positives that come out of it. Yes, they can do it, but the net result will be positive if it's, if it's done well in terms of international understanding and cooperation between nations. And it's really important for ASEAN and South Asia in the case of, of Myanmar in terms of the environment and culture and heritage, alleviating poverty, and also the, the very challenging processes that are required to heal wounds that come from conflict. So what we're going to look at today is issues such as what happens to a destination when the realities of a crackdown by the military on civilians the global changing of the destination. That's what's happening for Myanmar right now. What's the role of peace and human right to achieve a sustainable tourism industry? And also we want to provide opportunities for people from Myanmar to give their perspectives on the impacts of a military coup country and economic future. That's a difficult situation um, given the stress and the anxiety that people in Myanmar are facing if they are too public. And so today we'll report on information that's been given to us from people in Myanmar 
and to keep their identities confidential, uh, except for one very brave lady who will present to us today also um, uh, from as a Myanmar citizen. And also, how can the travel and tourism sector contribute to ending the violence and restoring democratic institutions? And what's, what's the road towards reconciliation and healing wounds of conflicts to help Myanmar into a peaceful and a sustainable future, and particularly how the tourism sector can regrow? So I'm going to uh, go through a couple of points first, and then I'm going to make some comments from people from Myanmar who don't wish to be identified. Uh, following me, we will have... Um, actually, we might put May, May, May Mo Wa, who's from WWF, a recording from her in, into this uh, as item number three. And then Dr. Talib Rufal from Jordan will make some comments, followed by Jens Franhart, who's based in Bangkok. Um, and then following that, we're going to move over to, to Norway and colleagues Stein Tonneson, who's heavily involved all his life in research relating to peace and has a lot of experience in understanding and researching issues in East Asia. And also a colleague, uh, Ava Ospai from Oslo also, who's been working in a lot in Myanmar on conflict sensitivity issues and a concept called do no harm. And then at the end, Dr. Louis de Moray, who's over on the East Coast of the US, will be joining us as president and founder of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism to give some final wrap up comments. There's a reality happening every day in Myanmar, and that, that is that there's people getting killed. And sadly, people are also being taken for detention. Um, and there's every day there is evidence of abuse of human rights since the military coup has commenced. And there are shock situations reported every day. As of um, this data has come out, uh, the latest one I've got uh, from the yesterday, the 9th of April, um, that we can see all 3,000 people detention, uh, over 500 people issued, and over 600 people killed so far. Uh, by military police in, in, in Myanmar. And every day on the national news here in Australia, just a couple of hours ago, they reported on 20, further 20 deaths occurring in the last 24 hours Hello. in Yangon. In my country, I'm in Australia. From a tourism point of view, this is what our government is telling us about Myanmar. And it's basically don't travel. There's the COVID issue, of course, which compounds everything. Um, and But the, the, the conflict and the unrest is uh, the major reason why the Australian government is telling Australian citizens not to consider travel to Myanmar. So the reputation of Myanmar, of destination Myanmar around the world is um, taking, um, you know, has a major setback at the present time. Uh, because of the conflict. Now, of course, this is a conflict that's occurred in a unique part of human history, and that's the COVID pandemic, global pandemic that's going on, where international travel has been shattered anyway. Um, and But as all countries are trying to deal with how they come out of the COVID uh, close downs, and that's still a couple of years away probably, um, looking for strategies for a destination like Myanmar, where now the predominant image is one of conflict and violence, it, it will make it even more challenging for an emerging destination to recover from, from a tourism point of view, uh, from the situation that's occurring in the nation. Just to give an example of what the international travel industry is saying about uh, Myanmar, uh, Asia Trans-Pacific Journeys is a, it's a very significant upscale tour operator based out of Boulder, Colorado. And they've been running uh, programs in Myanmar for over 30 years. And they are an example of this network in the global tourism industry that loves Myanmar and the people of Myanmar and are heartbroken by what they're seeing happening in Myanmar and are trying in their little way 
as many of us are outside of Myanmar to assist and support our colleagues who are in Myanmar and facing a very uh, stressful and, and a lot of anxiety in the conflict situation that's occurring internally. The, the idea of, of having an initiative to boycott the tourism and travel infrastructure that's, uh, that the military in Myanmar uh, supports or is dependent upon um, is uh, something that has been talked about and acted upon uh, before the coup by, by many players in the tourism industry uh, around the world. And there's, there's a, a lot of evidence to show which companies are involved. The idea of the Facebook page at this stage is a Facebook page which started with some communications that I had a couple of weeks ago with tour operators and travel industry people in Myanmar was to show the world, expose to the world, those companies that the military benefits from um, through, the, through the tourism industry. The United Nations Human Rights Council um, produced an independent international fact-finding mission on Myanmar uh, and identified those companies and networks where the military was heavily involved or owned totally. And they, there are two major groups that many will be familiar with which is Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited and the Myanmar Economic Corporation. And they are very widespread in their influence and connections and networks in the, in the, in the economy of, of Myanmar. And there's mapping that's done to show the connections between the hierarchy of the military and their influences in government and their influences in these corporations that prop up the military regime. I'm just going through those quickly just to show you that there is a, a lot of research that's done tracking these companies. And, and there is one, one agency, um, there's one slide missing there. Um, in the travel and tourism sector, those companies are, are very well identified also. There are lots of good sources of information to help us identify which companies are supported by the military in Myanmar. One group called Justice for Myanmar has done a remarkable job researching and documenting and reporting. And they're a source of information that we draw on to put quality information on the uh, tur boycott tourism uh, activities also. And just an example is the Hilton Hotel Corporation um, who are heavily in bed with corporations that are controlled by the military in um, in, in Myanmar. And so from an international point of view, um, there, is, there, are, there are interest groups who are, inter who are keen to put pressure on these global brands in terms of their ethics and their approach to investment and operations in, in Myanmar. Um, another source of information comes from the fact-finding mission on Myanmar that was supported by the United Nations that looked at the different industry sectors and where the military has its investments across all sectors. And in this particular next one I wanted to show was where the um, travel and tourism uh, appears on, on the reports there also. So it's, it's very clear which of the major tourism players in Myanmar have a direct relationship with the military hierarchy and investments. Another good source of information is the International Policy Digest. Um, and they've been, they've been revealing work about the Indian company Adani. And those investments by a group like that uh, are also important for tourism because they help, they, they, they provide infrastructure, um, which, which the tourism sector uh, benefits from. And also for the business tourism sector for various conferences and events and so forth. Um, so there, are, I'm just showing the sources of information that help build the database for identifying companies that are influenced by or sponsored by the, by the military. Reuters information, Reuters News Service Globally, um, journalists do lots of work on this also. And here's an example of a Japanese government uh, 
fund that is um, providing money to the um, to the Myanmar defences interests um, through hotel deals, and also this wonderful publication in Myanmar. Very brave people with Myanmar now uh, who deserve lots of support from inter inside Myanmar and external because journalists are under threat on a daily basis and they continuously doing great journalistic work to reveal the connections between the military and the tourism sector. So the, the message that I'd like to communicate through this webinar is if there are people who are able to share information, quality information is substantiated, that gives us inf uh, the, the, the information that of where the military is involved in the um, travel and tourism industry, that on the Facebook page that we share the information, we check it and make sure it's reliable information and that the world knows um, the extent of the military inf uh, involvement in tourism in Myanmar and, the, um, and we want to encourage the marketplace not to uh, support those enterprises. Um, Reza, I'm going to finish that section there and move on to, I'm going to stop share and move on to the section from comments from the people of Myanmar. And actually what I might do is just go back to there. Just go to here. So um, our speakers from Myanmar are acting in confidence. Um, they don't wish to be identified, but I'd like to read a couple of comments from some of the people in Myanmar who have sent material through to us. And this is from a, a young person in the tourism industry in Myanmar um, who's done training on do no harm and conflict sensitivity work in inclusive tourism in Myanmar. And this is what she said. Though it is not possible to identify myself because of security reason, I am pleased to present my view as a young tourism professional from Myanmar. We, the younger generation, feel that our future has been stolen away. The situation we are in is unfair, unjustified, but we are also determined to continue the fight for better and brighter future. I personally do not believe that tourism will pick up in Myanmar soon. It will take time much more than expected, depending upon the political stability. With borders closed, with the safety of civilians being threatened, the image of Myanmar as a tourism destination is not attractive among international audience. I sincerely request the international community to continue standing with the people of Myanmar by telling the world what is happening in Myanmar and by helping the people in need financially. Uh, another comment I've received from a person in Myanmar says, the COVID vaccination process is a disaster. And we have no idea what the real situation is regarding COVID here due to lack of treating. COVID military coup will remain the major obstacles to responsible tourism revival in Myanmar. Tourism remains a hopeful sector but we really need to provide excellent information on how one can travel responsibly in Myanmar and all in Burmese language first and foremost. One of the bravest people that I know right now in Myanmar is Mei Mo Wa. And about one hour ago, received a message from her because she was going to present tonight. And she said, while I am writing this email, there are several gunfire happening near me. Situation is not improving, making things worse. As I am using public Wi-Fi in tea shop to access internet, if they see me using email or Zoom, I might get detained. I don't feel secure to be out. I'm, and there is some shooting going on again. So she has asked to, for us to present uh, her presentation, which she pre-recorded and she realizes the risk that may be accompanied with what she's going to do right now to give her view from Myanmar. I just now have to change slides, so bear with me while I master the technology. And I have to go 
share screen. Uh, so just bear with me. Sorry. Um, no, that one there. And then I go. to go share screen that one and I hope the audio works okay on this this one Razor if you can hear me can you check if you can hear the sound all okay good day everyone yep. I'm sending you warm regards from Myanmar unfortunately I cannot be here with you today as the internet doesn't permit me to be here and uh, with my heavy heart, allow me to present you with the highlights of current situation in Myanmar and the future of Myanmar's biodiversity concern. It is uh, 69 days today since the Myanmar military has taken over the power. And uh, the early morning arrest of Aung San Suu Kyi, the president and uh, other politicians and the militaries took over control of the government on the 1st of February is a shock for all of us. And the military declares a state of emergency for a year and say it carry out the detentions in response to uh, alleged election fraud, handling the power to May online. I bring some of the important dates to reflect what had happened in Myanmar. In February, uh, the staff of the hospitals and the medical department across Myanmar stopped work to protest against the coup. So other ministries are also joining by showing the red ribbon as part of the civil disobedience movement campaign. The junta then removed the 24 ministries and the deputies, naming 11 to replace. A nationwide protest has happened in the February and, uh, and uh, there were 18 uh, civilians were being killed in February alone. In March, 27th of March and 31st of March is marked to be the highest number of civilians being killed and tortured. 27th of March is the unforced day, but it was called as a day of shame. And we also had a string of hope. The hope came from the CRPH by announcing its plans to form the federal armies, a federal democracy, and as well as the 2008 demolition or the abolishing of the 2008 constitution. In, in past a few days has been a very difficult in terms of the communications and the popular celebrities model and actor has been arrested by the military as increasingly targeting celebrities who have criticized the coup. So within 69 days, major impact is on the communication. It's uh, with the cut of the power, as well as the Wi-Fi cut, as well as the media channel and the terrorist soldiers and the so-called police commit torture in public daily to install a climate of, of fear into the community and people of Myanmar. Such inhumanity is casually and worryingly committed by this junta against the people. The chart here shows the number of the arrest and number of civilians killed within 1690s which is increasing and it, it is alarming for, for every one of us. And the creating, the public is creating the, the drumbeat of campaigns to ensure that we can continue to draw an attention and making sure that we didn't accept the military government and still fighting for the democracy. So it is what um, it is uh, what to look back how uh, to look the how what our future holds. You know it is unsure exactly why the military acted now as there's very little uh, gain for them. But it is worth remembering that the current system is uh, tremendously beneficial for the army. It has complete common autonomy and uh, commercial interests and political cover from the civilians for war crime etc. But it is clearly 
that uh, Myanmar people do not want to head back to a military future. And the consolidation of power under me online will only increase the brutality. If the CRPH brings for the federal army and people are willing for the civil war even to end for this fight. So public expectation is really mounted on the CRPH. We already seen the economic impact since from the COVID-19 and now we had uh, hugely impacted on our uh, industries and many of the industries as well as the individuals. Uh, and um, social punishment, it is something that is going forward and stronger than ever to the militaries, generals and family by calling international friends and the communities to help joining the social punishment. To if we are looking in the Myanmar, uh, uh, the biodiversity conservation, we are very lucky as Myanmar is home to a very extremely high biodiversity and the wealth of the natural resources. It is also home to the numerous endemic species. And we can say 233 globally threatened species are found here. And 65, 65 of them are classified as endangered and 37 critically endangered. So Myanmar, we, we, we say our home is uh, very lucky as we are very rich in the nature resource. But however, Myanmar has it also its own challenge. We already has a threat to the biodiversity such as uh, development of infrastructures and the forest conversion like a commercial agriculture. In a, it is a top driver for the deforestation in Myanmar because it puts the country at a high risk of the illegality and the land conflicts. We know that 75% uh, of these clear lands, like nearly 4 million acres are still not planted. And concessions do not follow any kinds of regulation to protect the environment or the local communities from the negative impacts. And um, even though the former government has stopped the logging permits, but the illegal and unsustainable logging is still continues. And also the, the livelihood for the exploration of NTFPs is continue, poaching, overfishing, water pollutions are continue, and also major threats to the biodiversity. And um, we also experience the climate, ch climate change impacts uh, with the associated stress on the nature system. And uh, from the key drivers, I also like to highlight that we have a weak institutional capacities in the country and we have lack of integrated development and land use planning as well as the lack of sustainable commodity production standards. And uh, growing con energy consumption in the region in the absence of then an alternative uh, energy visions are also the key drivers for, for creating if we are looking at the Myanmar forest covered in 2015, we said about only we left with 45% cover and now we are saying less than 45% forest covered in the percentage of land area of 66,000 hectares. As the forest land is degraded, the cycle is already broken. So the, for, uh, the purifying uh, purify water is impacted and the flood is impacted. Uh, and uh, to steward the nature resources, we it's it's uh, a local community involvement is very important, as the communities heavily rely on the forest and river for their livelihood, uh, by bringing the securities and the power of land management to the hands of the people who call their home. It is truly important because it will help the community restore the forest, and also this will make the communities more resilient to. Uh, climate related uh, shocks that have uh, long been a serve threat uh, due to their dependence uh, dependence on the uh, as we share our home with the um, home with the uh, with the wildlife um, but uh, Myanmar forests are falling silently like mentions uh, degrading forest degradations and our animals are also disappearing with a higher rate. Their homelands are being cleared for roads and farm like in other countries as well. So they are, they are being killed. The body parts are sold at the illegal markets. And um, 
Yeah, Myanmar is also uh, a, a transit, we can say it's, it's also a source and a destination country for a number of the most threatened uh, wildlife species, including tiger, Asian elephant, uh, Asian African elephant, rhinos, bears, and pangolins. So it is uh, estimated that more than 30% of the all wild tiger poach globally pass through the country of Myanmar. So it is also because uh, we have a leak, uh, very weak uh, legislations and limited uh, capacities within the government uh, law enforcement agencies. And so this is uh, wildlife crime and wildlife trafficking become uh, um, uh, it's uh, critical for the country itself. The, the illegal wildlife trade is also now is spotlight as a threat to uh, human health with a suspected link to the coronavirus. I will say it's there's so much to be done. I will say it if we say it's so much to be done, it could be an opportunity for us to work on as well. But for uh, to to sum up, a key issue for the country right now is balancing the unprecedented growth it is experiencing in the conservation and the climate resilience as well. Without the balance, the business that depend on the natural resources to thrive will also be suffer. So does the people and the wildlife, all who rely on the natural resources to survive will also be uh, critical. And so as Myanmar uh, is in a, I, I believe is in a good position to be address of the key technicals, uh, that the, the technical constraints, especially uh, level of the support that we have received in a, a, I was hoping the political stabilities and the right leadership and adequate support could empower our vulnerable people, our civil society communities, civil societies, as well as our communities and to protect the environment they depend on. And it may, uh, the conservation may not be the high priority for the country leaders. However, giving urgent conservation priorities, including the need to expand and strengthen the existing protected area system, as well as strengthening the legal and policy framework, as well as the uh, protected area management, which are also hoping that in future it might be, be happening around in the Myanmar. And um, with this, I would like to conclude by saying thank you uh, to the organizers, the teams, and also for inviting me to present today. As a Burmese uh, national, it is very painful to witness and to go through this difficult time. And uh, I have um, you know, witnessing the evidence of extreme cruelty and inhumane act daily is unbearable. We are deadly worried for our tomorrows. Please support any way that you can for Myanmar. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, so that was my colleague, May Moa, who's having some difficulty tonight or today as we undertake this uh, webinar with um, gunfire going on around where she is based with the WWF office in Yangon. And we pray for her safety tonight. Um, I'm going to now ask, Reza, I might need your help here with technology. Um, Dr. Tala Brefay from Jordan, um, former Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, to give some of his observations uh, about conflict and destinations and countries and, and the role of tourism uh, to, to help countries get back on track. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. I hope I'm heard. Is my voice okay? Yes. Forgive me, I'm a bit tired because I just got my vaccine two days ago, my second vaccine. So that's why my voice is a bit weak. Thank you so much, Steve, for all that you've done. I want to thank me for the wonderful presentation. I want to salute the brave people of Myanmar first for standing up for their rights. It's, it's an imperative. It's something that we have to respect especially in that part of the world that's not used to things like this, standing up for dictatorship. Now, having said this, I want to be a bit controversially, if you don't mind. I'm not for the concept of boycotting altogether, especially in tourism. Paul Rogers is with me now. He remembers when we went and visited North Korea. We went and visited North Korea 
I was still Secretary General at the, at the time. I believe that tourism, people must continue to visit places, even that these places are deprived, even these places are wrong in what they're doing. Because it's the only way that you could expose them, the only way to change the people. People of Myanmar don't need to be changed, of course. People in North Korea were very much in need of hearing us and listening to us. We came back with a story. We came back telling people of the world what we saw there. I think the more people that visit me, Myanmar now, the more the story is told, not the other way around. So the concept of boycotting must be looked again. And of course, I'm not encouraging at all you using the same facilities, like you mentioned, the Hilt, the and the likes. I think you could be discriminatory about where to reside and what to use. Connect with the community, but don't stop visiting Myanmar, please. It's my plea to you. Peace is about people meeting, more people people meeting each other. Meeting each other. The more people visiting Myanmar, the more the story is told. So what I want to say for the time being now, and I'll stop at this point. I'm ready to receive some questions and answers and defend this point to as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you Can't so hear. much, Tala. You're welcome. Steve? Should Can I you? mute Steve? Steve, unmute yourself, please. Oh. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you very much, Tala, for your comments. Um, I'll move now to uh, Jens. Jens, can you hear me okay in Bangkok? Yes, I can, Stephen. Okay. Um, Talib uh, raised some, uh, some very important points there, um, in particular about the need for the more people who visit, the more stories can be told. The boycotting of the tourism-related infrastructure that's owned and controlled by the military was the purpose of the Facebook site, as opposed to not in, still encouraging people to go. I mean, we've got COVID, of course, so COVID restricts travel. Um, but even if there wasn't a COVID situation in this situation, in the, in the coup had occurred, um, what do you think about the promotion of Myanmar as a destination while there's an, a military coup has been on. What's the pros and cons of encouraging international or even domestic tourism in a country that's in a conflict situation? Thank you, Stephen. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting on this uh, important debate uh, about uh, the situation in, in, in Myanmar. Um, maybe just quickly to step back, I mean, I, I work for the uh, Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, which is the regional tourism uh, framework for the six member countries of the Greater Mekong subregion in Southeast Asia, which includes Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and China. And with China, it's the two provinces of uh, Guangxi and Yunnan. Um, so Myanmar is part of our framework, um, and as such, uh, we, we obviously have been working with, uh, with Myanmar to promote tourism in the region and uh, looking to stimulate uh, uh, collaboration between the public and the private sector. Um, I'd like to go back to the comment of Dr. Taleb, um, because actually I was a part of the, the mission to uh, DPRK, uh, to North Korea, um, with the, the UNWTO, which I believe was in that's 2012 right. or something like that. If that's I'm... right, that's right. Yeah. That is right, that is right. And, and um, so I was, I was part of that mission and uh, it, it opened my eyes. And I, I think uh, I, I echo Dr. Taleb's comment that it is important to stay connected with the people um, of these countries. Uh, and as such also, I think um, I agree with, with Taleb that we cannot just close our eyes or close um, uh, our hands uh, to, to the Myanmar people. And as such, we, as uh, the Myanmar, uh, as the Mekong Tourism Collaboration Framework, we continue to support the Myanmar businesses. 
uh, as some of you may know, we have uh, our public sector framework and then we have our private sector framework, which is called Destination Mekong. With Destination Mekong, we have various initiatives that are supported by the private sector, including our Mekong Moments uh, uh, social media campaign, with our Mekong Heroes program, with our startup and innovation program, MIST. Uh, and we have a program called Experience Mekong Collection, which has over 300 small responsible travel businesses and social enterprises. 48 of them are in Myanmar. And we continue to talk to them um, because we believe that not only these small businesses drive uh, the social impact, they connect with the communities, but also they build the brand of the Mekong region as an experiential and sustainable uh, tourism destination. So we need to continue working with them uh, to make sure that they survive, which is obviously difficult, not just because of COVID, but obviously of the situation that we have in Myanmar. Because once tourism starts again, and we do hope, obviously we don't know when that will happen, but uh, hopefully at one point there will be um, tourism in Myanmar again, that then these businesses will help to restore peace uh, and also restore uh, poverty alleviation and connections with the communities. So I uh, very much agree with, with what Dr. Taleb said that, you know, yes, the situation in Myanmar is horrible. We have a lot of friends uh, that are uh, in hiding right now, um, but these small businesses and the initiatives that we have developed over the last few years with our destination Mekong framework uh, are now more important than ever to help these businesses in these difficult times. Thank you for now. Okay. Jens, thank you very much for your comments. We're going to just shift the dialogue now a little bit from a focus on sort of the tourism sort of specific experience and also May, May's comments about biodiversity conservation, which are really important because a destination like Myanmar, the biodiversity is a major attraction of the destination and very important for the development of its future tourism. So the conservation and protection and rehabilitation of those, those very rich biodiversity areas is important to the future of tourism uh, in, in Myanmar. But uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Stein Tonneson now to make some comments from up in uh, Oslo in Norway. Uh, Stein is research professor at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and the associate editor for Asia in the Journal of Peace Research. And he's, has, um, his areas of research include peace and nation building in East Asia. Stein, may I invite you to make some observations? Thank you very much, Steve. And let me thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, and let me first just say that um, Eva, who will speak after me, and I are a couple, as you can see on the screen. And we have spent very much time together in Myanmar since 2012. Um, there is a very big difference between North Korea and Myanmar today, because in North Korea, you have an extremely harshly and systematically organized state that is in full control of the national territory. That means the northern half of Korea. In Myanmar, I would say that we now have a failed state with several rival state administrations competing for the people's allegiance. Uh, and that is a situation which is quite likely to last. So this is, in a way, my, my main message. It's partly based on the briefings that were made to the UN Security Council yesterday by Richard Horsey, Sailan Khan, the acting foreign minister of the CRPH, the committee representing the Kudang uh, Luto, and also Cho Mo Tun, the ambassador <coughs> of uh, Myanmar to the UN who uh, is not recognized by the military, but who uh, represents rather the CRPH at the UN. This, their briefings were extremely interesting. Uh, I could have not been able to see them on YouTube yet, although they, pronounced, they announced that they would be on YouTube, but I've at least read Richard Horse's very astute 
and bleak assessment of the situation. He has five points to make in order to show that this is a state failure, a case of state failure when no one is in control. First point is the banks. The banking system doesn't work. There are strikes, there are closed banks, uh, they have problems with internet access and so on. So uh, people cannot take out their cash, companies cannot uh, administer their accounts and so on. And this is very difficult to rectify under the current situation. Number two, the supply chains in the country are not working any longer. And this will soon even lead to likely hunger in some places that are not reached by the transportation routes for supplies. Third, the health system is not working. The, uh, medis the, the uh, health personnel are often on strike. The military has taken over some hospitals that they use for their military purposes. And the whole vaccination program that had started, the whole fight against the pandemic is on hold. Fourth, armed conflict is developing again. The first effect of the coup uh, or of the planning of the coup was actually that the worst armed conflict that happened in the last two years in Rakhine State between the Arakan army and the Tatmado, the Union army, uh, ended in a ceasefire just after the elections in November. And then we also saw internet coming back. But since then, during the protest movement, we have seen that the Karen National Union, the Restoration Council for Shan State and the Karchin Independence Army have all condemned the coup and anyway joined the protest movement and are also engaged in active fighting. And there have been airstrikes against Karen areas. So the ethnic armed organizations are on the move militarily again. This is a resumption of the civil wars of the past that had in part have been put on hold through various kinds of ceasefires. One question I've not seen uh, anyone discuss yet is what's happening to the militias. The militias are not the armed groups, but those groups that have worked with the government and are under Tatmado orders. Are they now still, there are thousands of them out in the local communities, and many of them are in the border areas to China and Thailand. Tha Thailand. Uh, are they now still abiding orders from the Tatmado, or are they utilizing the situation to, uh, to gain local power or widen their local power? The border guard forces. Fifth point on Richard Horse's list was criminality. It's still the case in Myanmar that in the period of, since the opening in 2011, much of the country's economy and income comes from illegal activities related to natural resources. And this will be further accentuated in a situation with a failed state, where criminal networks of all kinds will be able to operate even more freely than they have done recently. Uh, all of this is in a situation where China is planning a transportation corridor through Myanmar, China will now be the economic magnet. It will continue to be the economic magnet. The Chinese border areas to Myanmar have been much more developed than the areas in Myanmar at the other side of the border. So in a situation with state failure, you will see the border areas to China being drawn more and more economically and perhaps culturally and politically also into China's sphere. If China then proceeds with building the transportation corridor and finds and needs and sees a possibility for creating the kind of stability needing for that, I think there will be a new big market in Myanmar for a sector where Chinese companies can thrive and where companies also in the border areas, particularly perhaps among the WA, will thrive. And this is the market for security companies. Secure, since the Tatmado and the armed groups cannot be relied upon to secure the areas where building works is happening, this will be, have to be taken care of by private security companies. And that may also have uh, an implication for the tourism sector. 
When we get to tourism, there are in a way two questions. One is, is tourism possible? When will tourism become possible under present circumstances? And the other question is the more moral question, is it acceptable morally and politically? I think that perhaps the question of moral acceptance of tourism as a whole will not be very acute because it will be so difficult to carry out tourism activities and attract tourists under the kind of situation that is now developing. But I would, I actually agree completely with the previous speech speakers concerning North Korea. It's extremely important for people in North Korea to uh, get contact abroad and to be able to tell their stories so they can be told abroad. I think that it's not in a situation of acute conflict in, as in Myanmar today, acceptable to uh, have tourism that is under the protection of the Tatmadaw. Uh, so the kind of profile that Steve uh, Noakes presented in his opening statement, where you do not boycott tourism as such, but where you boycott tourism in areas or where military companies are involved, makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, <clears throat> let me end by saying that th there is still, still perhaps some hope that one could see a difficult development. And if there is hope in something, I think it's primarily uh, Generation Z, the young people who have shown their remarkable ingenuity, resilience, and will to fight since the 1st of February. I think this has come as a complete surprise to the military and is a basic reason why they are not in control uh, of the cities and are not likely to soon get in control either. I think we also heard some of this uh, attitude among the young uh, in the speech that we heard before recorded by Mama Wo. Uh, the, um, this generation has really astounded me in the way that is willing to go on fighting and where everyone says that we are simply not willing to accept a military dictatorship. This is to an extent that I don't think we saw even in 1988. In 1988, the military killed thousands and managed in a way to, to, to stifle everything in the cities. This time, the, the number of killed is still in the hundreds. It's not past a thousand. And it has not been sufficient to frighten this young generation. And I think maybe it's too late for the military to do that because the young people are now even wanting to a great extent to get military uh, training and to join the ethnic armed groups in their fight against the uh, Tatmadaw. In this generation, we also see a new kind of multi-ethnic multi unity with under the federal formula in a way that we have not seen before. Well, that, and I think one reason why the generation, the young generation are thinking like that is that there has actually already been nine years with opening. So people who are 90 to 20 years old, they were just 10 to 11 when the opening occurred in 2010 to 11. So they are used to the internet. They are used to a relatively free press. They are used to being in touch with the rest of the world. And this is being played out in the protest movement. So the hope that we might have is that this will break the morale of the secluded uh, force that the Tatmado is, and that they will be forced through internal and external pressure to release Aung San Suu Kyi and set off some kind of new process of negotiations and perhaps recal recal reconciliation that would open the venue to restoring the economy, normal administration. But for the moment, it looks very, very bleak. You will have a combination of some areas controlled by the military, some areas controlled by the CRPH, some areas controlled by ethnic groups, which are probably going to widen, and some areas controlled by militias that will no longer follow the 
uh, orders from the military. Thank you. Stein, thank you very much for that very comprehensive and learned uh, comments to our deliberations today. Much appreciated. I'm going to ask Ava now to give her some of her observations. I've had the pleasure of working with Ava in Myanmar. She has a particular uh, expertise in many countries, including Myanmar, on conflict and violence as barriers to development. And that relationship between tourism and conflict and peace is discussed quite in detail in a concept called do no harm in tourism. And we actually pioneered for the world the first approaches of do no harm to tourism in Myanmar. And, and Ava was very much in the lead of that particular uh, approach. So Ava, can we invite you to, to add to our, our thought, thinking to, today, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yes, I'm just, I'll just pick up on, on uh, our experiences first, uh, Steve, with uh, working with the tourist uh, operators in, um, in Myanmar on exploring this concept of, of do no harm, um, which, was a, which was originally developed for uh, more for the humanitarian and development sector, but which we uh, which we, together with uh, fabulous responsible tourism actors in Myanmar uh, adapted and, and could see was, was very useful also for, for the tourism sector. Um, and just to, to go back to what Stein said, uh, a cornerstone of do no harm is to, uh, to have a, a proper understanding of the, of the context uh, and to look at the con conflict dynamics locally uh, in order to be in order to be informed and aware of how you might influence the conflict dynamics locally so i think for uh, for one one starting point for the for the tourism sector as we prepare obviously obviously uh, international tourism is is uh, some time off in in some uh, at least uh, for 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 the quanti quantities, but uh, as we heard before, uh, local tourism is happening. And in, in, um, in all the countries that I've worked in where there has been internal uh, violent conflict, there has been tourism, internal local tourism going on. So I think we will we'll do well in remembering that when we talk about tourism, we, just, we don't just talk about it people coming in from the outside. So we can just start to apply do no harm already in the current situation by supporting local uh, responsible tour operators in, in helping them doing the analysis of the, of the context. Obviously people who are there have a deeper understanding of, of conflict dynamics, but sometimes uh, in, in a situation like that, in such a diverse and, and large country as Myanmar, uh, uh, people from the outside can also help in, in uh, coming up with the analysis. And that analysis can be used for, for uh, uh, local tourists to begin with and later internationals can, um, can through the way they are uh, uh, support local capacity for peace and support, uh, support the uh, So, okay, I'll continue. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, but to look at how uh, how we can uh, ensure that the tourism that is going on now that will be coming uh, that will be going on, we know that the only thing that is constant is change. Even if it is like Stein says, it might take a long time before the situation has normalized. Things will change, and things are happening as as we speak, uh, also tourism wise internally. And to help the internal um, uh, tour operators in, in having that 
understanding, helping with the, the, the conflict uh, uh, perspective, looking at how this, uh, the, the ongoing tourism, the coming tourism, local and then the international, can ensure that it doesn't do harm, but uh, not just uh, not that, not just that, but also that it contributes to uh, local uh, peace, stability, uh, including through the, as was said, uh, exchange of ideas that we know it's, is, is so important. So, um, for example, by, by looking at how we can uh, support or, or uh, spread ideas about how to uh, for example, promote uh, tourism in areas that are not under the control of the of the army. Uh, that that will both give legitimacy. Uh, it will strengthen, and it will uh, it will also boost uh, these uh, the people in these areas. So um, I think uh, once we we uh, of course this has to happen in in very close collaboration with. With the local, with the local colleagues, but an example of uh, looking at how we might influence conflict dynamics is exactly this this list that you have made, Steve, or that you have taken the initiative to make on uh, on uh, who the who what um, businesses are owned or controlled by by the army in order for for the the whole business not to to uh, support these. Uh, this is the kind of analysis that we can help with, and this is the kind of also the the, the social shaming that uh, that Mame was talking about, uh, the importance of saying it and and spreading it and and sh actually the 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 role of shaming in Myanmar now I think is is very strong for the uh, for the um, army and that it's it's a it's a peaceful weapon that we can that we can also use in in helping so i think um to to ensure that the tourism uh, businesses stay alert to how it influences conflict dynamics which means both uh, how it can contribute to to ensuring that uh, that uh, ideas are spread that people can meet uh, and promote uh, a peaceful uh, development and at the, at the other side uh, ensure that it does no harm by actually being concrete and, and, and coming up with these kinds of creative, uh, concrete uh, possibilities that the situation allows for, for uh, how we can be useful in any kind of way towards a more peaceful future. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Um, you know, there's so much, so much to do um, in countries like Myanmar in the situation that they are in right now, in relation to a better understanding of ways to address conflict and and um, uh, and the do no harm approach is something that I think that's very useful for 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 Myanmar at this stage of its of its history. Um, we've had some good range of contributors so far. Uh, this is now for our last commentary. I'm going to invite Louis de Moray to do uh, so, say some words. Louis, about 30 odd years ago, founded the International Institute of Peace Through Tourism, and he's done a wonderful um, uh, commitment to this over a long, long period of time. And he's just got out of bed probably on the east coast of the US. Um, now, Louis, I've got your slides, Louis. Are you going to use them yourself? We're going to work out the technology. Here. Yeah, if, if you could uh, 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 put my slides up, uh, I'd appreciate it, Steve. Uh, I, I have been with you since uh, 7 o'clock this morning, and uh, I'm very impressed with all the speakers that have come before. Uh, it's been an excellent web webinar. Congratulations to you and to Riza and to others who have organized it. Um, it's an honor to be with you and to see uh, some of my old friends, including you and Jens, and of course, to be uh, with Taleb Rafai is always an honor. Uh, I see as well that Ajay Prakash has uh, joined us. Uh, he's president of uh, IIPT India. Um, Unlike all the speakers that have preceded me, 
I, I don't have any direct experience in Myanmar, but I've been asked to speak to uh, IIPT's philosophy uh, and those of you that are um, taking part in the webinar might uh, decide for yourselves how the philosophy might apply to Myanmar. IIPT's philosophy is vividly expressed in the iconic portrait of the global family by artist Padre Johnson. Uh, this is the first slide, Steve. Yeah, can you see it? Is it on there? You can, yep. Uh, next slide, sorry. Okay, great. We are all brothers and sisters in one global family, sons and daughters of the one creator, sharing one common home, planet Earth. Padre Johnson, the artist, is no stranger to war. He served in Vietnam as a medical chaplain, literally ministering to the body and soul of his troops, a special forces battalion, 90% of whom were either killed or wounded. Padre Johnson himself was wounded twice. While still in Vietnam, he was selected as one of the top 10 young Americans, the first military person to be so honored. Following the war, Padre decided to work towards a PhD in anthropology. To do his research, he spent 13 years traveling to every country in the world, about 87 at the time, breaking bread, telling stories, dancing with the people he met. He also painted portraits of his hosts in every country, dividing the world into 24 regions and incorporating portraits of the people he painted into each of those 24 regions. His portrait of the global family includes one person from each of the 24 regions, giving us a sense of the oneness of humanity and Padre's own reverence for life. Together with our common home, we all share planet Earth. We, are, we were honored to have Padre Johnson as one of our featured keynote speakers at the IIPT Second Global Conference in Montreal. Uh, the second slide, please, Steve. The conference was held in 1994 with a theme building a sustainable world through tourism. Also with us were US astronaut Edgar Mitchell, Soviet cosmonaut Georgi Grechko, and wheelchair athlete Rick Hansen, the first recipient of the IIPT Ambassador for Peace Award. Edgar Mitchell and Gregory and Georgi Grechko had circled the earth every 17 minutes. Rick Hansen went around the world in a wheelchair in 25 months, and Padre Johnson <laughs> went around the world in 13 years. IIPT is proud to have some 450 IIPT peace parks around the world, located on every continent except Antarctica. Next slide, please, Steve. One of these is located in Pieter Maritzburg, South Africa, which has also been named an IIPT town of peace. Pieter Maritzburg is where the nonviolence movement was born in 1893, when Mahatma Gandhi was thrown off a train for refusing to leave his first class cabin, though he had a first class ticket. The Reverend Martin Luther King was a student of Mahatma Gandhi, using the principles of nonviolence as a civil rights activist. Next slide, Steve. His younger brother, Reverend A.D. King, like his older brother, was also a civil rights activist. IIPT has developed a relationship with the A.D. King Foundation over the past several years. A.D. King believed that conflict is never the answer. He believed that building bridges of mutual understanding, cooperation, goodwill, respect, and love for humanity across gender, race, religion, and culture 
will achieve peaceful coexistence and bring the world closer to building a peaceful, loving, and gracious and gracious community of humanity. My friends, in addition to the current pandemic, the world continues to be challenged by a range of global issues, including climate change, species extinction, loss of biodiversity, and other global issues. While at the same time, some 700 million persons still live in extreme poverty. One in three do not have access to, to safe drinking water, and one in four do not have, had, have adequate sanitation. We can only solve these global issues and meet the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals as a world living in harmony, working collaboratively to achieve these goals. Thank you again for inviting me. Perhaps one day we can dedicate an IIPT Peace Park in Myanmar. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Louis. That's a wonderful idea and something that we, um, I think we should keep on the agenda in partnership with the International Institute of Peace Through Tourism. Folks, we've had um, with the YouTube and the webinar and um, the Zoom tonight, we've had over 5,000 people tuning in on this session today, which is, just shows you the global interest in what's happening in Myanmar in the tourism sector. I want to thank every, all our contributors for their participation and thank everybody for your interest in, in Myanmar. We've made reference to a couple of Facebook pages tonight. If you'd like to follow up on that and also with the tourism webinar, uh, it will be posted and it will be on YouTube and you'll be able to um, go back and check or, um, the, or any of the content that's been on here today. On that note, I want to thank Razor for all his help putting this together. And once again, thank all our speakers for their wonderful contributions from the four corners of our planet Earth today. Thank you. And we'll finish now. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. The recording will be available soon on the website as well, including the profile of the speakers and the PowerPoints. Great thank job, Riza. Thank you, thank you. Lou, I think you can go back to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> I must go to day, Reza. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Talib. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sultani. Thank you very much for your productive you. uh, session. Thank you. Dr. Sheikhi, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Ciao, Taleb. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. As, well, as always, as always. Thank you, Reza. Thank you for Thank me. you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.